Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, news, business, and self-development. Every month, members get one credit to pick any title, plus two Audible originals from a monthly selection, and access to daily news digests from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, as well as guided meditation programs. Between a full-time job in IT and a full-time job in podcasting, it gets harder and harder to sit down and read the books I'm interested in. This is where Audible comes in. I can listen on my daily commute, relaxing, or while out running errands and still get in the books I've been wanting to get into. You can download titles and listen offline anytime, anywhere. The app is free and can be installed on all smartphones and tablets. Now you can try Audible risk-free with a special 30-day free trial by visiting audibletrial.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. That's audibletrial.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. Don't let your busy life get in the way of that great book you've been wanting to read. Go get your free trial of Audible today. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. This is Jeffrey, and we've talked about many times before that I experience problems and struggles with my mental health. And really, without a healthy mind, being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is therapy does work. It's helped for me. But but what is is, is therapy exactly? It's it's whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help. Or maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships at work or you're not dealing well with stress. Whatever you need, it's really time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles. And, and it's time to start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is a customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. So join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. And there's a special offer to Nerdery and Murdery listeners. You can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at betterhelp.com slash nerdery and murdery. That's betterhelp.com forward slash nerdery and murdery. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a special episode of Just Nerdery, Episode 8, Goff's Revenge. It appears that we, yes, it appears we did a, an episode of DS9 about, uh, about a year and a half ago. Is that about right? About a year and a half ago. And uh, Goff was in yeah. the hospital with a heart attack. He wanted to be on the show, but he couldn't make it. So he is. Second one. Second one, yes. He is post heart attack now and and wants to talk about the stuff i forgot to talk about so today we're gonna do that so i'd like to introduce our special guest michael goff or golf um, hello everybody hey, for our guestery and with that we're going to talk about deep space nine deep space nine is the fourth iteration of the star trek uh series uh it ran from 1993 to 1995 or 1999 and with that, go ahead, sir. All right. I'm first podcast, so I'm not used to this kind of stuff. I'm used to just shooting the shit back and forth with me and Zig, and we can go for hours on DS9. But I re-listened to your episode last night just so I could familiarize myself with what the stuff you glossed over or maybe didn't cover as well. Okay. Uh, you You did get a lot of it, some of it. I want to take a bat lift to you, but <laughs> that's for a later date. But there's yes, a video so, with the bat lift, by the way. Yes, there was. <laughs> uh, yes, Star Trek. Next, our Deep Space Nine did start fourth fourth iteration of the Star Trek series. Not really 
popular with Roddenberry. No. He, he was in failing health at the time, so they didn't run a whole lot of it by him except for the concept. Uh, he had no direct, real direct involvement in the series. And a lot of people speculated that his lack of involvement was because he hated the series. It, it was so far removed from his clean and pretty Star Trek universe where everybody's happy, nothing's wrong. Earth is a paradise. Earth is a paradise. Yes. Earth is a paradise and everybody should want to be there. But DS9 strayed from that and took it to a more realistic, in my opinion, level. And it was also the first Star Trek series to run as a serial instead of self-contained episodes. Yes. Which I loved the serial aspect of it. You did have your filler episodes. It was fine. Some of them were cute. Some of them were really heart-wrenching. Hard Time with Miles O'Brien is my most heart-wrenching episode. Oh, God. Makes me that cry. One, that, that's my most heart-wrenching Miles episode. Yeah, because, because they, as they mess say, with Call Meanie in every season, at least. Absolutely. One. That that was the worst one for me was Hard Time. It just, that, that was a doozy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sorry, got got a lot of notes here. And yeah, that's brains good. running crazy. Uh, next generation, or wow, next generation. DS Nine mm-hmm. being a space station was, as you said, pitched as a western in space. Yes, it's a western, like a rifleman frontier town. frontier town. Yes, on the mouth of the wormhole. I love that concept. Uh, everybody has to be there all the time. You don't have just a lot of throwaway characters. You had uh, characters that were not not even main characters mentioned in the credits on a regular basis that were main characters. Yes. You had, you know, uh, Quark. Mm-hmm. Oh, Quark was a main a character. Major main character. Quark was a major main character. But Nog and Rom Nog, were not. Rom. You're right. Correct. Very correct. And Nog, the biggest glow up in Star Trek history. <sighs> From being a throwaway mention character, yeah. From being a throwaway friend to Jake Sisko, to being the war hero of AR five five eight. Yes, and a very broken man after that. Um, very you get, broken. You get to see how he comes back from <laughs> that because he gets his yes. leg blown off, and they can't fix it. Yes. Um, so DS9 starts off right after the uh, Borg invasion at Wolf 359, takes place five years after that. The Cardassians have left Bajor finally after 50 years. Year, 60 years of occupation, strip mining, and murder and rape. Uh, the Bajorans finally drive off the Cardassians. The Bajorans ask the Bajoran government. At the yeah. time, as the, the federation, government. the what? The provisional government. Provisional they, government. But they keep saying it's a little too provisional for me. Correct. Ask the federation to come in and help administrate the station and help administrate getting Bajor back on its feet. And um, Captain Picard makes an appearance in the first episode from Next Generation is a strong proponent for the Bajorans to enter the Federation. Therefore, he is uh, fully, completely for it, but he knows they have a long road ahead of them to get ready. So in we bring Commander Benjamin Sisko, Avery Brooks. And he's a commander because... He's a, he's a commander because he runs a space station, not a spaceship. Exactly. When he which... Gets- which really ticked off a lot of people Mm -hmm. that you have a black single father as a commander of a space station and he's not even a captain me i thought it fit perfectly everything worked avery brooks nailed the role he's completely comfortable in it and the relationship he had with sirak lofton 
was <sighs> incredible. Took him under his wing and treated him like he was really his own kid. Yeah, he introduced him in public as his, one of his sons. Yes. And that had a big impact on Sorok Lofton's life. You look at him now, and he looks like Cisco did. Yeah, yeah, he does. Like Avery Brooks did in the final season. Yes, he does. Yeah. And he had, and his love for cooking. Oh, yeah. Oh, he owns a restaurant. He, I was going to say, I believe he owns a restaurant. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, that's why he didn't want to be a part of the Cisco series because his restaurant was having trouble. Right. They're still talking about it, but I don't know if it's ever going to happen. I would love for it to happen. We we've, we've lost a lot of good people. Uh huh. Yeah, they so, have to cast a lot of people, and that that that's hard. Yes, especially Nog. You you can't recast Nog. Nobody's going to capture no. that magic. No, 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 you can't. And if, Odo, you're 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 not going to replace Renee. No, Renee Abergenwa cannot be replaced. No, I mean those are the only two I know of that we've lost, but. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's not as it, it's not as cast clearing as Babylon Five was, but yeah. <laughs> Which Babylon Five was kind of the precursor, or they were kind of okay. In... So how it played out, J. Michael Straczynski shopped his Bible around to all of these studios. They all right. got to read it, and then he finally found one someplace else. Rick Berman read it, and then he pitched Babylon Five or uh, Deep Space Nine. Yes, not. yes. So the guy, and you know, you know that he read it because there are two characters named a Ducat. I haven't watched Babylon Five in so long; I completely okay. forgot about that. Yeah, there are two characters named Ducat. You've got Gul Ducat, and then Ducat, right. the leader of the Membari, who. After he was killed, that's when the Imbari went to war with humans. That's another series. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Episode 110, sir. Because <laughs> there were 110 <laughs> episodes of Babylon 5. That's how geeky I am. Um, first season of DS9, hard to get through. Everybody's still feeling out their characters, trying to figure out what they're going to do. Uh, Dr. Bashir was supposed to be basically like the young heartthrob on the show, uh, always getting the girls, but they could not figure out his character for the life of them. They did not know how to write him, and it just came off as campy. And Alexander Siddig figured it out on his own. He's like, yes, he is supposed to be the heartthrob, but I, I don't see him that way. I see him as almost being a heartthrob like like in his mind he's a heartthrob but yes. in reality he's kind of this geeky guy who talks too much yes and and the way <clears throat> when you got into i'm lost on the season but when they got into uh dr bashir i presume when they found out he's genetically engineered Yes, yeah. you find out that this whole time he's been playing an idiot. Yes, to keep his secret. Yes, he's, to to have to have lived with that. Yeah, his whole life of constantly just being annoying and everything yeah. to hide his secret. To hide his secret that he was genetically engineered, and after that, after it becomes, he gets so dark. Mm -hmm. And Garrick. Another – Andy Robinson. Um, oh, my God. Yes, Gary. Comments on it. He's like, since you've – you know, Since you've come out. <laughs> yeah, since you've come out of the closet as being genetically engineered, <laughs> you seem a little more harsh. He's like, you don't think my boyish charm? And Garrett looks at him. Not so boyish anymore. Not so boyish anymore. Yes. Oh, Andy Robinson was incredible in that role. That was gold. His his portrayal of Garrick was just gold. Yeah, and 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 Andy Robinson again. Andy Robinson reads it and he's like, "Oh, this dude's trying to pick the doctor up. He's yes. not. He's not trying to fleece him for information. He's doing that as well." But and it was never written down. It was never said. 
But a lot of people think that the reason that Garrick was kicked out of Cardassia is because he was gay. Yes, I, I, I completely accept that theory, and I think that that's why in Nabrantain, who you <laughs> later find out is his father. Is his father. Yeah. Uh, kicked him out. He yeah. could not – one, he couldn't acknowledge Garrick as his son because that would have been a liability. Mm-hmm. Two, he can't have a gay son as the head of the Obsidian, Obsidian order. order. Yes. So he – excommunicated and banished him. Yes. And for our listeners, the Obsidian Order is the Cardassian government's secret police. The Garrick, SS of space. Yes. Garrick was very high up underneath Anibran Tain. Anibran Tain was head of the Obsidian Order for like 30 years and the only head to ever live long enough to retire. Correct. Yes. And even uh, Odo stated that the obsidian, the Tal Shiar admires the Obsidian Order for their proficiency and lethality, and yes, just the Obsidian Order is worse than the Romulans. Yes, <laughs> and yes. that says a lot. That's saying something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, the first season, everybody's getting you know sorted out in their characters. Uh, some of the makeup jobs, a little off. Yeah. Uh you especially with like uh Cork and Odo. As Odo. Yeah. yeah. It, it yeah. was very pasty and clammy looking. Yeah. And it obviously got better through the series. Yeah. They had to uh, refine it a little bit. Because, yes. Yeah, because Renea Bergenois was very angular the first and they he got softer as that first season progressed, and by the second season they'd soften his face up. But he was very angular and, and I think they sat down and thought about it and thought he wouldn't be. He's an amorphous solid. Yes. He's an amorphous solid. He would be smooth. Smoother. He would uh, be smooth everywhere because he's trying to imitate – well, I, honestly, he's not trying to imitate humans. He's trying to imitate a Bajoran. He's trying to imitate right. Bora. And when you find the scientist who first discovered Odo – you find out Odo's been trying to look because they have the same hairstyle. They have the same kind of cadence in the way they walk. Um, right. Find out he's the person that Odin, Odo is emulating. Yes, but he can never get the nose right or the, the ears. Right. Yeah. The ridges or anything else. Yes, he has a hard time with details because in his culture, he's still basically a baby. Yeah. Yeah. Even though he's a full – portrays as a full-grown adult. He's a baby. And the mental capacity of a full-grown adult and his race, he's still basically a baby. Yeah. Yes, he, so, an adolescent at most. Yes, I'll go with that, adolescent. Yeah. Um, Deep Space Nine brings in several familiar, familiar races from Next Generation. Yes. We have the Klingons. We have the Romulans. We have the Ferengi, the mm-hmm. Ferengi who were originally just supposed to be militant capitalists, uh, thieves. Yeah, well, they they didn't even really turn into capitalists until Deep Space Nine, where they went from having those energy whips that were completely useless in mm-hmm. Next Generation, yes, and having warships, which you've never seen a single Ferengi warship in Deep Space Nine. Yeah. No marauders or anything. No, no, you get shuttles. That's it. You get, you get shuttles, and you get like a complete revamp of the entire Ferengi society, where it goes from being a military, which they never even mention in DS9, to being... Oh, I, I I don't want to get get you mad for saying this, but the Ferengis are the space Jews. Do not say that. Okay. Do not say that. A lot of people have said that they are coded that way. Well, I, I don't mean it in a bad way. I do not mean it in any dis, disrespectful okay. way at all. All right. All right. So, but so they, they were they, okay. They were not okay. They were coded as as dirty capitalists. A lot of people took it that way. Because of cultural ideas of Judaism, right? And and yes, I I retract my statement. They, Thank you. They, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, but they just completely revamped them. Yeah. And the fact that they brought in Armin Sherman, who was the original Ferengi, mm-hmm. and bring him back as Quark. Mm-hmm. And he just completely reshaped the Ferengi society with the way he portrayed the role. And uh, Max Gordoncheck uh, as Rom, another huge glow up of a character from the beginning of the series to the end of the series. Yeah. Quark's idiot brother, who's actually an engineering genius. Yes. But because that's frowned upon in Ferengi society, it was never. Because there's no profit in it. Yeah. Because it was, it was never encouraged in him. And when it is encouraged in him, he becomes an incredible engineer. He figures out how to mine the wormhole. Yes. With, nobody else could figure it out. He figured it out while worrying about getting married. Yep. Talk about multitasking. <laughs> I, he's, he's, um, he is, well, okay. So with Arvin Shimmerman, with Max Gridenchik, uh, th- they're both Broadway guys. Right. So they bring a lot of that to it. And, you know, Armin Shimmerman, before they would do a, a, a Ferengi heavy episode, he'd invite everybody over to his house. Oh, yeah. His wife oh, would absolutely. make lunch. Run over their lines and get everything down and yeah. even add some stuff yeah. that they thought would be more Ferengi. Yeah. yeah they basically episode. wrote the Ferengi Bible. You know, the, 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 the insignia Ooh, for the Ferengi. Yes. <clears throat> that, but the insignia for the Ferengi. <clears throat> is a big fish eating a smaller fish. Look at it. That's the way they designed it. I I never even a big fish eating a small thought about fish. it. Yeah, that would be right in line with Ferengi society. Yes, um, which also gets made over because of Hork and Rom's mother. And yes, and and Rom Rom ends up becoming the Grand Nagus, Grand Nagus. the leader of the Ferengi civilization. <clears throat> and he's trying to make it more hospitable for people to live. This yes, show is incredible. Crazy. And it and, and like you said, that first season, it's a slow burn. Yes, very there, slow burn. There are way more filler episodes of that. And the first season is only like 18 episodes. Right. Um that first that first season is a slow burn, but it's setting everything up. Once they get to the second season, it kicks and just goes forward. You may be only getting se- the second season is still kind of slow. Um, it definitely gets better. You you get out more. You you've got the wormhole. You've got this whole new galaxy to explore. Uh, they still do a lot of uh, Alpha Quadrant stuff. And uh, you get that you get the Bajorans. Uh, they're they're. Provisional government almost fails. There's a coup yes. that they and they try and take back the station. Yeah, there's a coup that happens with some great actors in it. Oh my oh, god, the uh, cast on this. Frank Frank uh, Langella. Yes, yes. Uh, Went from Skeletor to Evil Bajoran. <laughs> yes, Frank Langella. Um, I can't remember the actor's name. He was the lead in Galaxy. Well, the male lead in Galaxina. Um, he, did, he was a character actor. Did a lot of stuff. Uh, you have. I know who you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, one of the brothers from Wings, um, and yes, he, and um, uh, uh, Richard Baimler from uh, Twin Peaks. Also, I, everybody in that was good. And and uh, Space Karen. Um, what one? Louise Fletcher. Oh, when oh yes. Who becomes the the High Ratchet? Yes. yes. <laughs> Who becomes the Bajoran spiritual leader, even though she is thoroughly an evil person. Absolutely. And it just shows the the evil of politics. Yes. Uh, we get a lot of returning characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, first episode, we get Miles O'Brien from the Enterprise. Mm-hmm. Who comes over? Who comes over and is um, a chief of operations of Deep Space Nine? Yes, and uh, trying to fix Cardassian, Bajoran, Federation technology all into one. 
keeps that man busier than anybody on the station. Oh my God, it's and an impossible he task. Loves, he loves every minute of it. Oh my God, it's he, it's, a, it's an impossible task too, and he pulls it off. Yes. He even told Worf that he preferred DS9 to the Enterprise because on the Enterprise, everything worked. Uh -huh. Nothing ever broke down. He got bored sitting in the transporter room. Now, he's so busy, he doesn't know what to do with himself, and he loves every minute of it. Keiko's not the biggest fan of it. Keiko <laughs> O'Brien, his wife, is not the biggest fan. I love the episode where Miles finds out she's pregnant again. Uh-huh. And Worf walks into the bar, and they tell Worf that Keiko's having a baby, and Worf loses his crap. <laughs> yeah, because he had to deliver Molly. Yes, I remember that episode. <laughs> and he just flat out states, nine months, I'll be on Earth visiting my parents. In far Russia. away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, that's he another is. thing. Worf... As much as it's like, well, Worf is the pantheon of Klingon culture. No, Worf is not the pantheon of Klingon culture. Worf is very traditional. Worf is Russian. Worf's Russian. Yes. Yes. <laughs> he's been, he's been, well, okay. They're from Minsk because so te technically Belarusian. But yeah. <laughs> he's, yeah. He, he, for a Klingon who claim, and I'm quoting Judzia. For a Klingon who claims to be traditional, he joined the Federation. He drinks prune juice <laughs> instead of blood wine. He is a contradiction in himself. Yes. He loves Klingon opera, but he drinks prune juice. He loves the empire, but he can't stand the politics. He doesn't go along with... You know, you have to do this just because we say so, and that's the honor of it. And he's like, no, no. you're wrong. No, you're wrong. And no, puts Gowron on on the throne as chancellor and then yes. takes it from him. Absolutely. Later, Deep Space Nine. And that is why he is now referred to as the slayer of Gowron. Yes, and I love that re reference in Picard. Yeah, slayer of Gowron. Worf, son of Moog, son of Rajanko. Yeah. Of, of the house. Uh, of, uh, house of Martok. House of Rajanko, son of Alexei, slayer of Bane of the Duras, slayer of Galron. Yes. Yes. Uh, we also get Galron from the Klingon. Uh, I'm yes. going to call him Emperor. Uh, it's Chancellor. Chancellor. Who be Worf, like you said, Worf put him on the throne in next generation. He comes back as the same person in yep. S9 and starts a war with the Cardassians. Yes. That the Federation Over perceived. Yeah. Which they were using as an excuse. I think the I think the Klingons were just using it as an excuse to get into Cardassian space and take over. Mm -hmm. And just use it saying that the changelings had infiltrated and changed the government. And that's why they went in. Yep. Even though they had no proof. Yeah. And so we spend a season fighting the Klingons. Fighting the Klingons, sometimes working with the Klingons, working with the Cardassians. Fighting uh, the Cardassians. Fighting the Cardassians. With the you have the Maquis, the who <laughs> you have the Maquis who are just a thorn in everybody's side. <laughs> And all of this happens before they really butt heads with the Dominion. Yes, yes. All of this happens before all of this great action in the first couple of seasons, minus the first season. Uh, but yeah, once once you introduce the Maquis and give that backstory as to why they're doing what they're doing, and that becomes a thing, Next Generation picked up on it and started using the Maquis on occasion. Voyager used the Maquis after it became uh, – a thing in DS9, or they, they had the Maquis in Voyager. You know, DS9 started the Maquis. DS9 started the Maquis, Voyager picked it up and continued with it, mm -hmm. with a bunch of the crew members being part of the Maquis. Mm -hmm. uh, once you get through the Maquis, then you get into the actual Dominion, mm -hmm. just 
little bits of the Dominion at first. It's things are disappearing. Colonies are disappearing and being destroyed. It's not the Borg. We know it's not the Borg. It's not the same thing. And they finally find out through trade dealings <clears throat> and through the Ferengi that there is a power base called the Dominion. Nobody knows anything about them. All they know is if you do something wrong, the Dominion sends in the this warrior race called the Jim Hadar, all genetically created in test tubes. They can fight. They are fully grown within three years and are lethal at less than three years. Yep. They're a, the founders couldn't. The founders who are the head of the Dominion created the Jem'Hadar, but couldn't fully control them as much as they want everybody to think. So they had to addict them to a substance called Ketracel White, which they cannot survive without. And in fact, every hour they go without it, the weaker they get to the point you could walk up and just push one of them over and they wouldn't yeah. be able to stand. And, and <clears throat> when they get really really hard into the throes of it when it starts going down they also start getting crazy in in murdery yes yes they will murder their own brethren and everybody around they don't care they can't help it they're they're lost in a dying bloodlust yes <clears throat> but true to jim hadar victory is life so maybe if you kill everybody you get to live that much more ketracel white for you Yes, it's dark. It, 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 it. I think it's the best Star Trek has ever been because even though it's so dark, you still get the hope. Yes, you you get lots of episodes that give you hope. You get, um, oh, what was Casey's current favorite episode? The one where Cisco builds the light ship. Yeah. Fun, not a meeting. There's nothing going on in that episode other than just exploration and Cisco and Jake alone on his ship. Yes. Good heartfelt episode. Oh, heartfelt. Yeah. In incredible. And it's the first time he grows the goatee. Yes. Long. Yes. That was the first appearance of the goatee, which, oh, they had to fight for that. Yeah. He had to fight for that. He had to fight for the shaved head later in the series because. In Star Trek's words, they did not want Space Shaft yes, to be the commander shaft. of a station. Or, or, yeah, Hawk in space. Yeah. Cisco but. is not Hawk. Cisco is, is, is even close to Hawk. Hawk's a bad guy. Cisco is a good guy. Cisco's always Cisco is a good him. guy, but do not get on Cisco's bad side. Yep. I mean, the only captain or the only Star Trek person to ever punch Q. Punched him right in the face. Being, Punched him and right in the face. He's like, oh, you want to box? Okay, let's box. You hit me. Picard never hit me. <laughs> I'm not Picard. No, you're easier to antagon <laughs> instigator. Yeah. Antagonize. <laughs> but yes. Yeah, so it was almost times. like when he hit him, I have I half expected him to say, say what again, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been great. Yeah, he was chained with some jewels. It, it was awesome. <laughs> Stay down. Stay down. Yeah. Uh I am completely lost in my notes. No, no, it's okay. Uh, we've only got it, we've only got about five minutes left. Oh, good Lord. Okay, so um, let me jump on this. Mirror Universe. Loved all the Mirror Universe episodes. Uh, great callback to the original series. Um, they did one a season, right? Uh, I think they did one a season for four seasons. I only think there's four or five episodes. I think one time they did two in one season. I think you had – I know the last one was The Emperor's New Cloak, mm -hmm. and uh, the one with, before that was uh, Cisco going back and helping them build the Defiant. Which the Defiant, one of my favorite starships. You still have my Defiant at your house. <laughs> one of my favorite starships, overpowered, supersized runabout that could take on just about anything. The only <laughs> person who could keep it running is Miles O'Brien. Of course. Worf helped a lot when he came aboard because that was his baby. That was his house. Uh, Worf lived on the Defiant. 
Yes, that's what I meant by his house. Uh, Trials and Tribulations. Loved that episode where they go back and they interact with Kirk and the whole uh, Trials and Tribulations episode, or the Tribbles episode. In fact, we reintroduced the Tribbles to DS9. That is correct. Tribbles come back. Yes. Uh, Little Green Men, another favorite Ferengi-heavy episode of mine. Yeah, where the Ferengi go the back Roswell in time. Connection. Yeah, go to Roswell. Uh, the mag- I, I have oh, to and the you first. finally get to – okay, in that episode, you finally get to see how the Universal Translator works. Yes. Because yes, they're yes. speaking a different language, and they're – And you finally Nog get fixing to hear it. the yeah. yeah, and then Nog's fixing it, and he fixes it, and, and, and then the people come in, and Quark just starts speaking English to him. They're like, how did you learn our language? I didn't. I fixed the Universal Translator. Yes. Which brings me to uh, – that makes me think of Farscape with the microbes, and yep. now they can speak any language anywhere. Yep. I like the universal translator better, but um, – The mag- Babel fish. <laughs> it's a Babel fish. Let's yes. just call it – yeah, let's call a Babel fish a Babel fish. It's a Babel fish. Keep it in their uh, ear. The Ferengis have to be my favorite in the DS9 universe. I love the first Just from the whole, entire glow up of the whole race from evil evil hobbits yeah. to just financial capitalists. Yes. And then on to what they did. Quark becoming a woman. Yes. Classic episode. It teaches him humility. He starts acting better after that. He's still going to hold the line, though, and be a complete Ferengi. Yes, even yeah. though their entire society is changing. DS9 has got to be my favorite Star Trek series of all time. Just for the the darkness, the realness, the grittiness, the fact that not everything ends happily. You, you lose characters. Yes. You get main characters that die. Yes. And that doesn't happen usually in Star Trek, or it didn't happen before that in Star Trek. You didn't kill off main characters. No, you had a new character that everybody seems to know, but you've never seen yeah. them before. They're going to die. That's yes. What happened in the old series. Yes. But, but in this now, season, you get to know people, and they get off. You get invested. Oral I mean, Antos. Um, uh, uh, Jadzia. Jadzia. Yeah, one that of the main episode. characters dies. Yeah. Uh, Nog losing his leg, AR-558. Um, that was a big one, and that's where everybody was talking. Uh, Aaron Eisenberg was talking about how vets would come up to him after that episode and after the uh, following episode where he did his therapy, telling him that it meant so much to them. It really hit home with them. It helped them out a lot. It was a great episode. Uh, originally aired, Nielsen ratings gave it, I think, an 8 out of 10 as being one of the best Star Trek episodes ever written. Yeah, I would those agree with those two episodes. Yeah, and, and what's amazing is they put one in between them to kind of lighten the blow. Still yeah. a serious episode in between them. Absolutely. Yeah. If, oh, my God, it was beautiful. Okay, so have we talked about what you wanted to talk about? I need like three days of talking to be able to get through everything. Okay. I know how it is. We're we can okay. episodes. We, we, we can come back later and talk oh, about Oh, yes, it. absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad to have finally been here and not in the <laughs> hospital. Not in the hospital. No more heart attacks. <laughs> no okay. promises. I'm immortal. I'm going to live forever. I got to test it out once in a while. Are you really? Okay. All right. Well, You've been around for most of my stuff. That's true. <laughs> I would like to. Oh yeah, I've I've known golf since I was like fifteen. So just, yes. Oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, so um, with that, I would like to thank Mike Goff or Goff for coming on and doing the show. Thank you very much. Yay for the guestery. Yay uh, again for any of our fans out there. We're, we're going to go ahead and load the video onto our uh, YouTube page, so it'll be out there, so, so readily able for you to see. Uh, probably closer when the episode airs. Uh, if you'd like to stay on and be our patron, that would be nice. Thank you so much for you, uh, for your assistance. Everybody, come on and support this guy. Thank they, you. They need the support. They have a great show. Thank you. Worldwide, it is awesome. Yes. I love listening to the show. Thank you so much. Thanks. I love. <laughs> I love having you on. <laughs> Finally. 
finally, and not for the last time, I will be back because I didn't even touch half my notes. Right on. I just I just got into the whole yes. talking like we normally talk when I come I over and stuff like that. <laughs> okay, so and so thank Goff, and with that, I have been Zig with your nerdery. I have been Mike with your nerdery. <laughs> <laughs>